I can see you again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've had so many questions, both on the app and on Instagram. So we're going to do our best to work through all of those in the next hour. We will leave a little time at the end as well if anyone's got some questions that come up from um, what Annie talks about as, as we go through the session. Um, we are most likely going to do a second part to this in the new year because I, just, I think we've got so many questions we're, we're going to need another another session but we'll do our best to move through all the questions that we have got so far um, but if you're here and your question and um, we don't get to it then don't worry we are going to be back in in the new year with with Annie to carry on with this so first of all the first question we've got how do you move forward with parenting when your ex is a narcissist and determined to get revenge and I've had a couple like this, um, you know, how do you co-parent and try to heal from the abuse when you have to deal with them every day? You know, how, how do I stop being angry and try to co-parent um, when I hate him for what he is and what he's done? So, you know, a lot of people, they're struggling with co-parenting with, with a narcissistic yeah. ex and, and needing some advice. It's a huge topic. So first off, um, I would say that you will never co-parent with a narcissist in the sense that, yes, the narcissist is the other parent, it is the biological parent, he or she, but in reality, narcissists do not parent. They use their children to get your attention, to exercise power and control over you and they use them for photo opportunities and credibility so in public a narcissist will be a fabulous parent and they will compete at a very low level for their children's affection by buying them things that you don't if money is an issue but they will never properly parent so I think you have to let go of the belief that they will do their part effectively. So then you come down to some different questions, which is how do I manage damage limitation with my children, which is already a big question. And also how do I manage my own feelings about the narcissist? Because there are two things, two kind of things going on with your feelings about the narcissist possibly you hate them and you're still struggling with the feelings of gross injustice about what's been done to you and also you likely feel intimidated by them so as regards <coughs> Both of these things, you do have to work on your own healing. You have to work on rebuilding your sense of self, which you have lost, and stopping reading the narcissist's subtext. You also have to shut down all possible communication with them that you don't need to have. Depending on the age of your children, there will be a variable amount of communication that you need to have with them. But whatever that amount of communication is, you want to shut it down to only what relates to your child. You don't want to get into any conversations about them. You don't want to know about how wonderful they say that their life without you is, because they will surely drop that one into the mix if they get half a chance to make you feel bad. You don't want to let them have unlimited access to you. You have to communicate about your child you can do that via text, via email. You don't want any unnecessary phone conversations or face-to-face -face conversations. And they will use every opportunity that they can to manipulate you. Rebecca, you mentioned the revenge thing in some of the communications that you got. Um, 
I was wondering what narcissists are seeking revenge for. Um, if you left them, they will be very peeved. But equally, if they left you, they will still be peeved because they don't want you to have a happy and fulfilling life without them. They want you to be miserable. They want you to remember that you weren't good enough. They're kind of like small children who don't want you to play with their toys. They don't want you to have anything of theirs and they don't want you to have anything that will make you happy in which actually they're worse than a lot of small children most small children um, so they they're just really very spiteful and they want to make you unhappy so you don't want to engage with them because otherwise they will sooner or later start telling you things to make you feel bad Things like, oh, I've taken the new partner to the places that we used to go, or, oh, I do this for him or her that I never did for you. It doesn't matter what they're doing with the next person. The good thing is that they are out of your life so that you can start to heal. So you want to shut down communication as much as you possibly can. You also want to understand that they will play you everywhere they can so that as well as this thing about oh i'm so happy without you in my life they will also run this program where they will be almost reasonable for a time and you'll think whoa we're making progress we can actually have a communication we can talk about things like reasonable people again that is never going to be lasting. That is part of the setting you up and then knocking you down again, which is the way narcissists operate. So the more you limit your communication and the less attached you can be to having anything with them, the better it's likely to go. So you limit yourself to factual stuff you know this is when you're picking so and so up this is when you're bringing him back or her back whatever it is and no expectations and also you never want to show them emotion they will do their best to upset you and the best thing that you can do is grey rock them as much as possible. So I know I'm talking a lot at the moment. Is grey rocking a term that you are familiar with? Is that one that's in your vocabulary, Rebecca? Um, I had to learn about it <laughs> not that long ago, um, but I think it would be quite um, beneficial actually if you could just explain a little bit about that grey rock method for everyone because yeah. it is actually a really helpful technique. Yes, um, Grey rocking is the technique whereby you give them as little emotional feedback as you possibly can. Narcissists feed on your emotions, especially your distress and your stress. So whatever you do, you want to be as matter of fact and as unemotional as possible with them. Um, my mother this, he used to have a phrase which was the nearest thing to an idiot, which she used about people. It wasn't very complimentary for sure, but I must say that that kind of approach, the almost idiotic response to the narcissist is quite effective. So they'll start on about something and you just go, hmm, I think that could be a little bit of a stain on the wall there that I've got that I need to deal with. And you just shut them down. You give them nothing that they can engage with. You know, I'm really happy with my new partner. Oh, that's lovely, dear. What shall we have? What shall I make the children for supper tonight? No, no, don't you answer. I'll just think about it. And totally, um bore them rigid the art is to bore them so much that they don't even bother to engage with you if possible 
So what you're doing is giving them this almost Teflon coated surface, which anything they say bounces off. Will they think worse of you for it? That could be an issue for some people, but the truth is actually, they think so little of you anyway, that it doesn't matter. And also once you get into the knack of gray rocking, it can be quite amusing for you. Um, I worked with one lady whose ex-narcissist, he wasn't a parent, he was someone who was actually professionally useful to her, and she remained in contact with him on that consideration only. I do apologize about my dog. He's a little bit narcissistic too. He likes to be part of things. But she, he was useful to keep at the periphery of her life. So he would send her long communications and she'd go, oh, that's interesting. Did I tell you that I've got the most marvelous pigeon on my balcony today? And it was almost like he was communicating with me. And the narcissist being a narcissist wasn't unduly bothered about that. It didn't change anything, but she actually found it quite entertaining to understand that she had this freedom of movement, that she didn't have to impress him, that she didn't have to react. It actually brought her back some of her power. So grey rocking is a way of being as creative as you choose to be in not giving the narcissist the satisfaction of the emotional response that they want. And don't worry about how they think about you. Yeah, exactly. I've got um, another question here. Um, how do you emotionally deal with everything when after leaving them, they still have control over your life and will use any way of getting to you, which is now through the children? How do I deal with him favoring one child over the other? three big questions. So the first one is that they still have control over life, your life. So you have to consider, is this true or is this the narrative that you're telling yourself? And what I think it probably would mean is that you still feel that they are in, that they are in control of your life and that you are in their power. It's unlikely if you're separated that they do have control of your life. It just feels that way. And therefore, the work that you have to do is to start thinking about how you challenge that belief in yourself and how you take back that power. Of course, they want to be controlling and you have to create a space in your own mind where they're not doing that. You have to, um, you have to redefine them and understand that they are actually pathetic, spiteful, um, emotional toddlers. That they're cunning in that they can use adult intellectual resources to get at you, but they're still pathetic, nasty little toddlers. And actually there's quite a good um, technique that you can run that can help with that. Would you like to uh, have a play with this? Yeah, great, let's, let's hear about it. So this one actually requires you to close your eyes and just visualize your narcissist behind a glass screen so that you're safe from this person and you can see them and you can see them and you can see how and you can notice how intimidating they are to you. So the first thing you want to do is to literally start shrinking them in your mind's eye. It helps if you keep your eyes closed actually when you're doing this. So you close your eyes and you're visualizing shrinking them. So you want them to be the size of about, you know, a small doll or something, really tiny. And then 
realize that you're t you can tower over them now. So there is tiny little toy sized things and then you want to dress them in a different way. They're presumably wearing their adult clothes. So then now the next thing you want to do is visualize them and they're wearing something quite inappropriate. So if they're male, you might want to put them in fishnet stockings and a basque or something. Um, or if they're female, put them in a shaggy bear suit or whatever it is that they would really, really hate. And just notice the look of indignation on this tiny person's face. And then you don't want anybody to stamp on them, or they might not mind it really. So you park them on a shelf. And there they are sitting on the shelf, their little legs hanging off, you know, hardly big enough to be to move from it. And you want to change their voice because they're surely spouting angry words and you want to give them a sort of cartoon voice, a sort of I've swallowed the halogen voice. And you can just hear the stupid things they're saying coming out of that silly little voice and just look at them and think how pathetic you really are and just look at them and see them as that tiny little person sitting on a shelf, spouting fury, looking ridiculous, and then let it go. And you can revisit that if you want to. And it's one of those crazy things that shouldn't make a difference, but it enables you to start laughing at them and it takes the factor of intimidating them out of it. There's only one small part of it, but it can be a fun thing to do, to start reminding yourself that they're actually obnoxious and ridiculous, but you are moving on to a place where they cannot harm you anymore. And a lot of what they harm that they can do, they have already done anyway. So I've just got pop-ups here driving me crazy on my laptop. Um, yeah, so that's, you've got to deal with the controlling thing. That's really important for you. Um, sorry, that just distracted me a moment. No, that's okay. Um, so it's how do you stop them controlling you? Yeah, and obviously the, the person asking the question saying they'll use any way of getting to you, which is now through the children. Yeah. And they also seem to have a, the challenge that the fact that the he, um, or she doesn't specify actually um is favoring one child over the other and so yeah. how, how do you manage that yeah so again they will try to get you through the children they really will they will um use the children because they know that children are leverage so the first thing you have to do is gray rock wherever possible that is don't react any more than you have to. Keep control of the manner of communication and the frequency of communication as much as possible. And understand that they are not parenting. So you've got the issue where, depending on what the legal arrangements are, they will have to spend a certain amount of time with the other parent. And that is really difficult to manage, certainly. But you have to manage the situation the best way you can. If you think the child is seriously at risk, you obviously have to report it to Child Protection Services, social services, whoever you need to do that with. Um, Beyond that, you have to establish some ground rules with your own child that they don't bring home to you the annoying aspects of daddy's house or mummy's house. You need to know that your child has been safe. You need to know that your child has been fed and looked after, obviously but you don't need to know the things that the other parent is deliberately saying about you for your child to feed back to you. You just don't need to hear that. You have to assume that it will probably be toxic and not even go there. 
And then there's the other huge piece, which is that you have to work on the benefit, that, uh, on, the, on the basis that the other parent is not parenting. You are the sole competent parent. So you have to trust that you are a good enough parent and you can provide the safety and the stability in your child's life. That's the best that you can do. Is that perfect? Absolutely not. But children have grown up well even without one good parent. You can't offer them two good parents, but you can offer them one good, loving, supportive parent. And that has to be enough. And the other difficult piece is how you cope with the child's feelings. Particularly children who are old enough to articulate the fact that the other parent is really difficult, maybe sometimes rejecting um, and problematic. You can't deny it because otherwise you're gaslighting your own child, you're subverting their sense of reality. But equally, you don't want to take them into a daddy's a horrible or daddy or mummy is a horrible sick person and it's a real shame that we have to have something to do with them you just have to acknowledge that that is how they are and they're probably doing the best that they can and maybe it's not a complete fit for what the child needs you have to acknowledge the child's truth in the most useful way for the child and it is an incredible minefield that you have to pick your way through but you can only do it as honestly and compassionately as you can and if they have you rock solid behind them they will come through this yeah thank you Sorry, I was on mute there, I just quickly unmute myself. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, how do you know your ex is a narcissist? I feel we are quick to judge or label them as a narcissist, but if you can share some symptoms and qualities of a narcissist so that we can get a better perspective. Yeah. Well, this is the question that always concerns me. Um, because whether they are or whether they aren't a narcissist in the end probably doesn't really matter the fact is you have come up against a brick wall in your relationship which is why the relationship had to end you reached the point where there was no effective communication where you felt rejected betrayed disregarded invalidated um and it was a relationship that was dead in the water because you're working it at it and they weren't. Yeah? You don't walk away from a relationship. I rephrase that. If you are a normal, loving parent, you do not walk away from a relationship with your child's father or mother. So I work mainly with women, hence the gender bias, which is not intentional and not to suggest that there are not women narcissists because there are. But you don't walk away from your child's parent without a great deal of soul searching. Uh, so you leave someone because they are toxic for you. So that's the first thing. You don't have to pin the narcissist label on it in order to be able to say this was a relationship that wasn't working, that was dead in the water. But how you identify the narcissist, there are some signs that will really help you to do so. They have an exaggerated sense of their own importance. They tend to have really quite a good hero story. And 
or a really good victim story. My own ex a partner, he had both. He was the only one in his workplace who knew what he was doing. He was the one who carried the weight of the workplace on his shoulders. And at the time he had a fabulous um, victim story from childhood as well. And he was victimized in the workplace too. There was an element of truth in that in as much as he drove everybody so mad that they were happy to victimize him. Um, they also, yeah, they're incredibly self-important. They, um, they are, have a huge sense of entitlement. They will always tell you what a wonderful and special person they are. <laughs> yes, you know that one? No. Yeah. God, they can go on to, you know, I'm a really wonderful person because I took out the garbage. Wow. And I did it better than anybody else could ever do it. Wow. They, they're always that much more special just because they're them. They have this incredible sense of entitlement. I was working with a client recently who is um, a graduate of a top law school. And her husband said to her, well, I, I didn't marry you for your brain. I didn't marry you because I knew you could cook and clean and look after me, you know, and that's what I expected. And they have this sense of entitlement that your life is there to serve them. They are capable of cognitive empathy, which is, means that they're actually quite smart. They can pick up on your feelings very accurately and they can read people pretty accurately, but they have no empathy in the sense that they don't care about your feelings. They're really happy to ride roughshod over your feelings. And if you tell them what hurts you, they will do it again. So these are unusual feelings. They truly believe they're superior to other people. And they can normally bore for Britain. Yeah. <laughs> if you get into a conversation with a narcissist on their specialist subject, and they seem to have a huge number of specialist subjects, you could lose the will to live before they finally shut up. And if you open your mouth to say something because you're with guests, friends, and you can see your friend's eyes glazing over, they will turn to you and say something like, will you let me finish? Uh, so they, they have to have the limelight. It's always about them. Um, they're arrogant. They can be indescribably rude to people who they think don't matter. So one of the tests in the early days of a relationship with a narcissist is noticing how they behave if you go out for dinner or if you're somewhere where they speak to underlings because they could be charming to you because they're in their love bombing moment and they could be vile to this other person. Someone once told me about a date they went on with a very charismatic narcissist and they had to go through the Dartford Tunnel to get back from where they were coming from. And this guy actually heated the coins with the cigarette lighter before he handed them to the guy in the Dartford Tunnel. It's going back a long time, but I mean, that just says it all. They treat underlings normally not necessarily with that degree of contempt, but they will be offensive. And they can be stunningly rude to people in positions of power. Um, they, my ex-husband was rude to a policeman once. He nearly got a fine for parking in exactly the wrong place under the policeman's eye. And when I apologised to the policeman, he then started fighting with me too for being spineless. Um, others fight with judges when they're working on the divorce case. They are just incredible like that. 
and they really contend, they also indulge in behaviours which could be argued are lacking, that they lack anger management skills, but they don't. They choose to vent viciously when it suits them and they can control their temper when they need to. So I think those are some of the key features of narcissism. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that will ring true for pretty much everyone on, on this call tonight, I reckon. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of familiar qualities there. Um, yes. And then I guess leading on from this, um, and this is an interesting concept actually, do you think a narcissist can ever change their behaviour or even become aware of it? Or is it just a case of that is what they are, you, you've got to just let it go and obviously work on your own healing? I think, you know, is it, do they ever know? Um, that's, that's, do they ever know is really the $64,000 million question. I think the various things going on, yes, they absolutely can change their behaviour when it serves them for as long as it serves them. Is this fundamental transformation? Absolutely not. There's a client of mine who was divorcing her husband. He had, he has a lot of money and he doesn't feel that he owes his children a penny of the money that he owns. I mean, they're only his children. Um, so he decided, as many of them do, that it would be a good idea to come back and not spend the money because you know come back have the affairs it works it's a lot cheaper so he went to see a therapist the therapist told him as he was a narcissist he came back to his wife with his tail between his legs and said oh, i'm so shocked i discovered i'm a narcissist i don't want to be a narcissist i've just discovered i really love you I want to make this relationship work. Please, will I, you take me back? I promise I'll be a good boy forever after. And the trouble is that when you hear this stuff, you're hurting and you really want to believe it because you don't want to believe that all the love and the effort that you've poured into this relationship is going to go down the pan. You don't want to deprive your kid of the other parent. So you go, and you also don't want to feel that you could have something to regret. You don't want to leave any stone unturned. So you go, okay, okay, you finally got it. Yeah, we can do this. And sometimes they even say, I can't do this alone. I need you to help me. That is a real sign that they're not going to do a damn thing for themselves. But they are so sweet and engaging and nice that you give them another chance. And in this client's case, he managed to be on his better behaviour for, I think, about a month. That was all he could manage. Um, they can pull it out of the bag for a while, but they do not change even if they're showing their good boy or good girl behavior they don't change from a narcissist point of view narcissism narcissism is actually a kind of superpower they're better than you they're smarter than you they can read people far better than you can they can manipulate people better than you can. A lot of them can crawl up greasy poles the way you can't. They can charm their way into another relationship with someone often who looks like an upgrade, younger, whatever. Um, they don't want to change. They want what they want. So no, they are not going to change. They think they're smarter. Yeah, definitely. And then, so moving on from, from that and then thinking, I guess, about people 
yeah, I've got a few questions here related to you know, people who have come out of narcissistic relationships are going through the healing and, and are now looking to date again or thinking about the future, or thinking about future relationships. Um, and the first question on this topic is, are there any specific techniques to help with bringing down the walls of protection that are built up um, to let people in um, and you know, learn, learn to trust again? And how do you make sense of all that's happened um, to not feel like you're really messed up from their actions? Right. This is, um, this is a whole world. Um, I actually wrote a book about this, Do You Choose Your Dog More Carefully Than Your Partner? Based on the fact that um, I did. And you have to learn to do better next time round. So first, you can't just go out and date again. You can. But the truth is that when you've been through a narcissistic relationship, if you start dating too soon, the fact is all the narcs for narcissists for about a thousand miles around will smell blood and start circling like sharks. Um, this is a cautionary tale and there must be one or two times when it doesn't happen, but the number of people who are hurting from a narcissist relationship who go out and find another narcissist who may present differently, but is still equally damaging. That number is very, very high. So you have to do your own healing. That's one part of the process. You have to get yourself relationship ready. And that doesn't mean making over your clothes, your hair, going on a diet, working out at the gym. That means understanding what you really want in a partner. Because what I find with people that I work with is that actually first time round, they didn't actually know. They, they, you find all sorts of criteria, which nice table manners, good enough. I don't want someone who sticks his head in the plate. Um, nice table manners, dresses nicely, fair enough. Changes his underpants and washes every day. Yeah, I get that. Um, has a job. Yeah, that's a good one. Doesn't abuse drugs or alcohol. Also good. But that is only the baseline. You know, what kind of relationship do you want to have? How do you want to be treated? What do you want to feel like when you look at this guy? How do you want to relate? You know. What are the values that are most important to you? You've got to get really, really clear that you're, you're going to find someone who can give you the kind of relationship that you want to be in. And in order to do that, you have to rebuild your self-worth. So there is all of that to consider, which is already huge. So each part of that, take you know could take a long time to discuss in detail and then there is also the other piece about trust um, and I know I was talking with someone the other day about needing to be more then they were coming out with this line about needing to be more open needing to be more vulnerable and my approach to that is no you do not need to be more vulnerable. Uh, I know vulnerable is a buzzword at the moment, but actually you have been incredibly vulnerable. Your first duty to yourself is to keep yourself safe. And you do not meet someone who's got nice table manners, dresses nicely, has social graces, etc, etc, takes you on a couple of dates, appears to be interested with you, in you and starts to, and start to trust them. They have to earn your trust and they have to earn it incrementally. Most of us who ended up in a narcissistic relationship did this old pattern. Meet someone, fall in love, dive into the relationship head first. 
um, and kind of like it's a great swimming pool and you don't even check to see whether there's water in it. And this time around, especially with children, you have to get it right. So you have to keep moving forward slowly and making sure at each stage of the journey that they are trustworthy, that their actions match their words, and they are worthy of getting that bit closer to you. And you need to take it as slowly as you need to take it. Because one thing that we know is that narcissists love speed. Narcissists love to woo you, fall in love with you within sort of five seconds of setting eyes on you, and then knock you off kilter and commit you to a relationship before you've even known quite what's going on. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, a nice person is prepared to take the relationship at the rate that you're prepared to take it at if they see that you are someone special. So the only thing here is for you to get yourself into this headspace where you know that you are special and that you bring something valuable to the table. And so then would you say um, that that is just a really key part then of rebuilding your confidence after a narcissistic relationship? Because that, that's a question here about how, how do you do that? You know, how do you get that confidence back? Right. Um, yes. Um, I kind of reminds me of the Arnold Schwarzenegger thing when he was asked how he built his muscles. And he said, oh, I just eat ice cream and exercise for five minutes a day. Um, and it was a great answer. But... There's a lot to it, but you do have to think that you have been totally programmed by a narcissist. In the course of your relationship, you have doubtless learned that you're ugly and stupid and fat and worthless and unattractive and all of this stuff, because that's what narcissists lead you to believe, and that you're incredibly lucky to have them. Mm, luck like that nobody needs so you have to actually unpick all of those toxic beliefs none of them are true you're incredibly resourceful or you wouldn't have got out of the relationship you're incredibly strong or you wouldn't still be standing even though you may feel like an unset jelly a lot of the time you know you're a valuable lovable person with a lot to give but you have to do the emotional work to believe that for yourself. So that's really what needs to happen before you go out dating because you cannot ever rely on someone of the opposite sex to give you a sense of self-worth when you don't have one. Otherwise, you will be a hostage to them. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Um... I've got one more from the list here and then I think we've got a little bit of time maybe to open it out to to everyone who's who's dialed in if, if anyone's got any questions based on what we've spoken about but I think this one actually um will resonate for, for everyone here and it's how can I avoid being a victim of another narcissist in the future it is very much the same answer as before in fact one you have to spot the signs of narcissism. So they come on too fast, too strong, too fast. They're too full of themselves. They push you that little bit further than you want to be pushed. You have the kind of relationship that's too perfect and not perfect at all. You feel just a little bit smothered by them. They don't quite add up. They've got all these past partners who were crazy. You know, normal people have previous partners who were probably normal. Narcissists have collections of crazy people in the past. Um, so you want to, they may have very few friends. You want to watch out about consistency, words match deeds, that they keep their promises to you, that if they say they're going to text, 
they text, that they're consistently available, that they don't have these bizarre mood swings, that they're on you, off you. They don't compare you to other people. They're not leering at other people when they're around you. So you want to be watching out for the signs of narcissism. And also if they never shut up talking about themselves and they think they're the best things in sliced bread, abort, you could die of boredom, even if they're not narcissists, really. Um, yeah, you want someone who's gentle, sweet natured, and generous hearted, I think, mm -hmm. you know, bad boys are really overrated. I'm sorry, I don't know what the equivalent of bad girl is. Um, but you know, these, these demanding types are really overrated. They may be nice for a night or a month, but you don't want to be living with one of them. So you need to know about narcissism. And you also need to know about yourself. And you need to be able to say with confidence two things. One, I trust myself at any time to abort this relationship at the first red flag. A red flag is when they do something that does not sit well with you. And the truth is so many of us saw so many red flags and we went, well, yes, I don't like that about them. But on the other hand, they've got so many good points that I'll just overlook it and we'll work on it later. Like he's the most, I remember one woman said to me, he's a fantastic guy. He just happens to be a little bit selfish, like my dog. <laughs> Bless him. Um, he wasn't a little bit selfish. He was an absolutely evil narcissist as the truth came out he played dreadful mind games that guy not my dog um so you have to be able to say at the first red flag i will abort because red flags do not come singly where there is one red flag it is an outlier for a thousand other red flags so you have to be able to say, I will abort at the first red flag because I can't afford to go through this again. And you also have to be able to trust yourself that you will be able to pick yourself up next time around if you mess up. Mm -hmm. That you have to be, find the resources in yourself to go, ouch, that hurt, but I can just get on with my life. Mm -hmm. So conscious of time does mm -hmm. anyone on the call just now have any questions that they'd like to ask um annie based on what we've been talking about tonight um just feel free to unmute yourself and 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 ask a question or you can drop it in the chat whatever whatever you're more comfortable with <laughs> sorry about him <laughs> question um anyone I can see one here. Is there one? Oh, okay. Is there a way to empower your children? It started. Oh yeah, is there a way to empower your children to deal with a narcissist? That depends very much how old your children are. And I think you don't want to ask too much of them at any time because that person is always their parent. You need to be able to support them totally. That's what they need from you. And they also need to see a great role model from you. I've spoken with many people who've said, I tell my child to do this, this, that, and the other. And I say, yeah, and what are you doing? And if they're not living what they say, then the child learns that actually they are powerless if they see you are empowered that will help them to be stronger and confident in themselves in dealing with their narcissist parent also okay. and there's a, there's another one actually here um related to, to parenting children it's from lou who says how do i protect my six-year-old from being damaged in the same way his father has damaged his older kids so, uh, sorry, um, is it? Or, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I was just like listening to what you set, said, but um, 
my ex, um, he's, he's generous with, it, with his money and he'll help in any way, but he's more selfish on the emotional front. Mm. He can't even comprehend his own son's feelings. So is that a sign of a narcissist then? Um, it could well be. Yeah, it's certainly damaging for your son. Yeah. And did you ask how you protect your son? Or is this another question in time? Um, I think that's another question. Right. Yes, he could well be a narcissist, but does it really matter? The fact is that he is um, an, a somewhat incompetent parent. Right, okay. Because obviously I kicked him up because like he, he was a cheat. He cheated on me like 10 times and I kind of put up with that until I had enough. Um, 10 times is rather a lot. It sounds like he's got something <laughs> going on like quite possibly narcissism. Thank yeah. you. Does that answer your question okay, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, just back in the chat, this how do I protect my six-year-old from being damaged in the same way his father has damaged his older kids? Yeah. I th well, I th the difficulty is when that damage happens, um, because there are areas of life that you can't actually step into, you cannot get between the father and the son. However, you can only support them. Uh, support your child and give them the love they need when they get home and give them, you know, a reality check. You have to unfortunately accept that they will have difficulties with that parent. Um, parent narcissists often get bored with parenting, which can be a blessing that they can sort of lose interest in their own children. That's I always see that as a bit of a bonus, really, if they're damaging to their kids. Mm. But you can't stop them doing what they're doing. And if you call it out too much, they will know that it hurts you and therefore they have an interest in doing more of it. And it's if back you, to the control, isn't it? Yeah. If you can find a way of saying, you know, that so-and-so thought it was a bit silly of you to do that, that might just work. But there's not very much you can do directly with them. Okay. And then I've got two more in the chat here um, before we wrap up. It's, so the first one, after a year of putting the boundaries in place with the ex, I still find it heartbreaking to be apart from him. Is it possible to form a friendship going forward for our child's sake? It's not for your child's sake, it's for your sake. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this, this whole question doesn't quite hang together for me. Um, you've got boundaries in place. I'm not sure what that means because emotionally there aren't real boundaries in place. And there's underlying this, you want to be friends because it would feel better to you if you could have some kind of happy closure. If you could co-parent in a civilised way and salvage a friendship, that would be really nice. But the chances of ever doing that with a narcissist are really very, very limited to the point of non-existent because narcissists don't need you as a friend. Um, they can control you. What do they need you as a friend for? Um, so, no, that would be your sanitised closure, which would be nice for you, but for them, no, it's not going to happen. Mm. And that, you know, that, that is really hard. And I guess that's where we, um, people going through this, have to work harder at that healing process as well and, and the different techniques that you've, you've touched on earlier as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, then the last one we've got here. How do you deal with and rationalise happy memories with your narcissist? Were they ever real? That's such a difficult one. Because in the end, it depends on your beliefs and what you want to believe. Um, 
my personal take on it is that when I look at, back at my relationship, I remember very few happy memories and that sits well with me. Clients often tell me about the happy memories and there are two things that are going on there. One is that they tend to be sanitizing and romanticizing their memories and when we actually talk about them, those memories were not nearly as nice as they choose to remember them. And the other thing is that those happy memories tend to lead them down the road of nostalgia and regret and this feeling that they've lost something wonderful and it could have been the best thing that they were ever going to get. And it tends to make them very unhappy. So I would be very careful with those happy memories if they were not real then you have to decide what that means for you and to me the what comes out of that is that you put everything that you could into the relationship you did your best to have a happy relationship and that is all credit to you and the fact that it wasn't what you wanted it to be, and you couldn't see that because you couldn't get inside a narcissist's head, is just unfortunate. But you come about out of the whole relationship with honour. And that's really important. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I hope that helped the person who asked. We are out of time. That went really quickly. Um, I'm really sorry if you're on the call and we didn't get to your question. I do have a whole other page of questions here that we just, we just didn't get to. So we'll definitely be back in the new year with Annie um, and we can um, give the opportunity on the app to ask more questions if you've got them and we will, I will keep this document with all the questions we've collated for this um, and we will be answering them again in the new year. But Thank you so much, Annie. That was incredibly useful. Um, and I know everyone will have got a lot from that. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Oh, it was a pleasure to join you. All right. Thank you then. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.